and it's been this relationship that's been happening ever since and created a lot of growth for myself and given me the ability to uh, hopefully share some of that with others and um, I mean I was a child musician singing in a trio with my uh, two older sisters in Portland Oregon when I grew up and I sang Elvis songs and uh, we sang some standards and uh, uh, that was my experience with music and then there was this period of time I wasn't doing any music but I was rather um, a musician's old lady and uh, I was referred to back then and uh, when I got out of that space and those relationships I was on my own and began to uh, take notice of the peace movement that was happening, the anti-war movement and started going to demonstrations. Um, I happened to go to a uh, SDS conference in Princeton. This was probably about 1966, maybe. And there was a uh, workshop on women's liberation, which I went to. And um, that really changed my life totally and gave me a framework to understand my own life. And uh, I became part of uh, a group, a consciousness raising group, and then a larger group called New York Radical Women, which uh, planned the Miss America Beauty Pageant protest in Atlantic City in 1968. And um, I went there as part of that demonstration, but also I was a movement photographer. I had gotten involved with photography and also working with a group called Newsreel. And so I brought a 16 millimeter camera with me and a couple other women did sound and I took the photos. There was lots to, uh, to take notice of and to document. And um, we talked about chants and things like that. So I wrote, the first song I ever wrote was a parody uh, that we sang on the bus and just one verse of it was a... Uh, Ain't she sweet, making profit off her meat? Beauty sells, she's told, so she's out plugging it. Ain't she sweet? No. That was, that was, oh, I wrote a song. You know? <laughs> and um, that became part of the soundtrack for the film that I, well, the film was called Up Against the Wall Miss America. And it's still available today through Third World Newsreel. Um, and I have a copy if you ever want to see it. Too. Um, but that became iconic, that film. And um, that song didn't necessarily become iconic, but it, it really uh, jump started me into writing songs that expressed what I was going through. You know, um, I. It was, it was those, those changes that motivated me to write the lyrics I wrote, and it uh, carried over into songs about heartbreak and love, and there was one song I wrote um, that went, I'll give you just a little bit. Um, oh, baby, just want to say, Cause baby, now I see Our love ain't right, I can't be yours and still be me So, <laughs> that was a political song um, And I, you know, it kind of is where I try to come from most of the time Which is my own experience my own authentic self, um, how I relate to the things that are happening around me. You know, you many of you know my songs, and um, they are rooted in pretty much real things. Um, and I try to to stay away from. You know, I've done my share of freedom and you know, like justice and all that stuff. But for me, the songs that really work are songs that tell stories and that can 
get those concepts across without using the same words that there are many wonderful songs we can use to, to, to say those words, you know? I mean, I'm not saying you can't say freedom, you can't say power, you can't say love, you can't say that, but it's more than that to write a good political song, you know? It's not just those correct words that get across this concept, you know? It's, I think, it's important to work, uh, go further than that, go deeper in yourself to find a way to express things so that they, they come from, you know, your own, how you feel, where, what you've got to put into it, or if it's about a struggle that's going on, to try to find, use the words of people who are in that struggle. Um, and if, if possible, to musically reference, you know, like you, I've done a lot of songs that about women in Africa, for example, where I'm not able to replicate the totally the rhythms, but I adapt and I'm drawn to music from other parts of the world, so I try to incorporate that in what I do as well. Um, I've written in response to requests, like, would you write a song for me? There was a film being made about the struggle at Co-op City um, many years ago when the, the whole Co-op City folks were on strike. That's a big housing, it's actually co-op in, uh, in the Bronx, and there were 64,000 people on strike. And it was really quite an amazing struggle, and I watched the footage of um, the filmmakers had been doing interviews and there was a young Puerto Rican woman who was talking about the first, that it, this was her first involvement in organized struggle and she said, together we can move mountains. And we've all sung that song together. Together we can move mountains. And it's never died, you know. I mean, sometimes I've kind of wished it had. <laughs> you got ones like that? <laughs> but lately, for me, it's come back, and I feel like I'm singing that with, you know, meaning again in a way that I haven't felt for a while. Um, I, as part of Newsreel, I, I worked on a, a, a song for a film called Janie's Janie. Have any of you ever seen that film? It's a wonderful film about a woman from um, Ironbound, New Jersey, who, who uh, was a working class woman, had a bunch of kids, a husband who, you know, was never there. He worked, but he, you know, he just got drunk, went to the bar at night. And uh, uh, she said, uh, that when she finally left him, she said, you know, I was daddy's Janie, and then I was Charlie's Janie. And, now in Janie's Janie. Yeah. And so I wrote a song called Janie's Janie that um, became kind of, you know, known. And a lot of people I remember. I used her words, you know, like the end of the song goes, My name is Janie and that's me, but I ain't like I used to be. I'm Janie. Later, I was studying Marxism and reading about dialectical materialism, and I thought, well, damn, Charlie's got a story too, you know? So I wrote a story about Charlie, and, um, you know, like, Charlie's all alone, trying to hide his hurt. Well, he can't let his friend see him cry, you know, that kind of stuff. And I, uh, I sang it for a woman named Robin Morgan, who was uh, had been in New York Radical Women. Some of you may know who she is. And she told me I was a danger to the women's movement. 
Yeah, really. So, you know, I had my issues with the women's movement as well, because, uh, so I ended up 19 years in a rock band, basically, but doing political songs, and songs, but that came from a personal place a lot. And, um, it's one of the songs that went kind of viral in the ways things went viral back then, you know, so no one knew who wrote it, but I actually wrote it, uh, was, uh, they whistle for me like a dog and make noises like a paw. Heaven knows they sure got problems, I agree. But they problems I can't solve cause my sanity's involved. And I'm tired of bastards fucking old me. <laughs> kind of relevant, you know? <laughs> That's kind of an all-purpose song. It is. You can have a very small-scale reason for singing that song, or you can have a very large scale. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was just inspired to <laughs> I think what I want, the, what I want to emphasize, though, is, you know, to be authentic in yourself and your experience. and and learn. I mean, go and, and learn as much as you can. There's songs now that made that song in like mountains and we were there, the other song that's become well known that I do. Those were songs really easy to write for me. I mean, mountains, I probably wrote it in half an hour, you know? And, and we were there was also another one that I just felt channeled. But not all songs are like that. You know, like some songs maybe take a month or maybe take even more than that because it depends. You know, like the sewing machine song, I'm going to sing it like later tonight and some of you know it. It took me several months and it took me running it by people, you know, and asking for their opinions and getting some incredible advice. You know, like I had written it as a three chord song initially and you could still sing it with three chords. But Robin Greenstein said, why don't you follow the melody with the chords, you know? You know, like, and it changed the song, made it really, what I think is probably one of my best songs. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. But anyway, <laughs> I think, do you want to jump in here at all? I mean, I can jump a little bit. Jump. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting always to hear people's stories of how they, got into this because I don't think there's a lot of people out there who like see it as a career track. And, uh, <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, I, uh, I think that as a kid, there were a couple things that I did know. One was that I wanted to do music. I didn't really know what that meant. That could have meant a variety of things. I was definitely from a family where you went to college and you started talking pretty early about how you were going to go to college. And so I just decided I was going to do music in college because that sort of fit what everyone seemed to want me to say. Um, I didn't know what that meant, though. And I listened to the radio. I loved rock music. Um, I think that I was aware that there was folk music, but I, I wasn't aware that it was different from rock music. Um, and then I was also aware that there were funny songs. And so Tom Lehrer, were, that, those were records my parents had. But there were also, this was like the, the late 1970s, early 80s, there were a couple of funny songs that would come on the radio from time to time. And they were like, um, they were like stealth songs, because the radio would, would normally be playing this rock music. And you know, the late 1970s rock music was, was really uncomfortable, sort of, sort, sort of like, Charlie Daniels, blue. a lot of it was really kind of right wing. And then there would be um, these like stealth, um, what's the word? Like they would come on and they would sound like a, one of the normal songs on the radio. And it was only until you would listen for a little bit that you would realize, oh wait, no, this is someone making fun of the song. And a couple years after that was when Weird Al Yankovic came along and it became like clearly a, a genre now, only he's the only person in it. Which is that <laughs> the song comes on and you think it's the song by the police or the talking heads or whatever, but it turns out it's the Weird Al version of that song. And not everyone liked that, but I and a lot of friends of mine really got a kick out of the fact that 
it wasn't. It didn't even matter how funny they were. Like sometimes his jokes were sort of medium, but the, the fact of their sort of infiltrating was what was kind of exciting about them. And you could sometimes sneak them. Like sometimes I would get to DJ my high school dance and like sneak a Weird Al song. People would be like, "Oh, I got it. Very clever." Um, so I don't know. There was always something kind of enjoyable about that. And then there was Monty Python who wrote songs that were sort of based in this, what I didn't know at the time when I was a kid, but this sort of English music hall style. They weren't a style that I otherwise quite understood. But I understood that what was one, one of the things that was funny about them was that they were sung in this very serious way. And they were sung by people who definitely, you could tell by their voices, thought they were being very serious, but then the things that they said were all wrong. <laughs> And one of those was the Lumberjack song, which yeah. you, do people know this? Okay, right? So that's just like, part of what's funny about it is the voices of the Canadian Mounties, like realizing in the middle of the song they're singing that it's actually about transvestism. And, and then like stopping the song and looking at each other and then starting again with the chorus, because the chorus part seems kind of safe. Um, so I think I always thought that, and, you know, so there's a political dimension to that too, and who knows what Monty Python thought the political dimension to that was. Graham Chapman, who was a member of Monty Python, was gay, but the other Pythons didn't know that for a lot of the time that they were actually making those TV shows. Um, interesting. So, um, I, I think I w it was, it, was it, it somehow got into my head quite early that um, funny and or political songs were kind of sneak attacks. They kind of like fit into the dominant culture by surprising you, by pretending to be something else. I also remember the moment when I realized that there was this comic strip called Doonesbury, which was like the other comic strips and that it had pictures and all that, but it, and it was funny, but what was in the comic strip was also on the front page of the newspaper. And I thought that was very exciting that somehow something had gotten from the part of the newspaper that I, at the age of nine, didn't really read all of or much of, but then it would show up in the, in the comics section, and then I would want to go back and read the story to find out what the comic was about. Um, so it kind of always functioned this way for me, that I could like imagine that um, like you wouldn't have to say you were a folk singer, you would say I'm something else, but then you would sneakily do something that wasn't kind of expected in whatever genre you claimed to be. Um, and this became a sort of a hobby of mine, to be frank. I thought I would be a rock musician for a while, and I was in a rock band, and that was fun. This is, I'm about 18 or 19 at this point. And a couple things happened. One was I discovered I didn't like playing in bars. Um, I put a lot of work into the music, and then I realized no one is there to listen to it, and that's kind of a shame. Um, I had a very strange experience where I was at the University of Illinois, I was playing in my rock band, and a group called the Rainforest Action Group asked if we would play a benefit for them. And I said, yes, I would love to do that. And would you like us to do any songs about rainforests? And they looked at me like, what? <laughs> like that thought had completely not occurred to them. And in fact, they weren't really sure that they liked the sound of it, to be honest. And they sort of told us, yeah, you know, don't, you don't have to do that. And then I felt really weird. I was like, wait a minute. They, they oh, I think the problem isn't them. I think it's me. Like, I think that this music, like, they just don't know that there's a connection between what I think I'm doing and what they think they're doing. And then I looked at what I was doing and I was like, well, I guess, yeah, I don't know why they would know that. This is, this is rock music and it's, you know, some of the words were okay, but you couldn't really hear them because we were a band and we didn't have a good PA and so forth. Um, sad story in and of itself. But I actually, I read an interview once with David Byrne, the, talk, the lead singer of Talking Heads, who sang it very strangely when he started out. And someone asked, why did you sing that way? And he said, the PAs were all so awful, it was the only way you could hear me. <laughs> so it wasn't just me. Um, so what I started doing, oh, and I, also, this, I should probably also say this, around the age of 19, it would have been 1989, and I was coming out of the closet, sort of, sort of, not on any particular schedule. Uh, a lot of people knew, but not absolutely everyone. I didn't have a public persona. I didn't have any sort of public persona. I certainly didn't have a gay one. Um, and I started to realize that if I pursued this rock thing, I would have to basically kind of go back in the closet. At that time, that was pretty much true. I didn't know 
Uh, that, that just didn't sound good to me. Um, not so much because of what it said about my sexuality, but because of what it said about the rock music world. I said, like, I don't, that doesn't sound like the world I want to be in or encourage other people to be in. So I sort of kicked around for a while. I got very interested in classical music. I started to discover that I loved Schubert songs, which is interesting and also very distracting because he wrote like 600 of them, so that took some time. <laughs> and ultimately, um, what, what I realized I was doing was sort of writing a funny song when it occurred to me and then going to like an open mic night in a college town and playing my funny song as part of the set. Everybody else was pretty much playing serious songs. Some people were very good, um, and I stuck out. And I was fortunate that enough, not everyone liked that, but enough people liked it that I dis discovered that I could really enjoy that as a hobby. And um, made a couple of friends who decided they wanted to do it with me. So then, then I had this hobby, and then I moved to San Diego, and one of my friends moved with me, and then we became the Prince Michigans. And the Prince Michigans initially, for, for years actually, just played at open mic nights. We didn't have any really any real plan outside of that. Um, you know who Jason Mraz is? Yeah. He was, we hung out with him. <laughs> we were all playing in the same open mic place in San Diego. So it was kind of like a, it was before he was famous, but it was kind of like a, a very hip open mic situation. Um, and San Diego is a really conservative town. Um, and it has many sort of generations of people who have figured out a way to be some sort of hippie in this very conservative town. And one of the people who found us was uh, the people who run the local NPR station. Um, and they must have just come into the coffee shop one day, and they asked if we would come and play some songs on their radio show. So we did that, that was nice. And then they said, well, if we gave you topics to write songs about, would you do that? And at that point in my life, I was kind of like, oh, this is, it's a challenge, you know, like, <laughs> it's a terrible idea. Because the idea, like, they would give topics like, well, there was a sort of a public art funding scandal in downtown San Diego that we wonder if you would write a song about. Because, oh, that sounds like a song for the ages, right? <laughs> and I was actually quite excited about that. Uh, right around that time, I was listening to a lot of Phil Oaks, and I was realizing that there were a lot of things on his records that were about news stories from the 1960s that I otherwise would never have heard. And he has an album called All the News That's Fit to Sing, which just kind of basically says right out loud, that's what I'm planning to do. I'm planning to sort of freeze these things in time. And um, it was working because there I was 30 years later hearing those songs and learning about these news items. So I am... Um, <laughs> I thought I would do that too. I thought I would write songs and not worry at all about whether they would last in any meaningful way. Um, then, <laughs> then George Bush happened. George W. Bush happened. And we had gotten to this point where our hobby had sort of grown into, well, the coffee shop wants you to play an entire night of songs. And then people started coming to this, those shows who at first had been coming just to hear the funny songs, but now they were a little bit desperate. Wow. You know, now the audience sort of were looking at us in a way that I imagine people might have looked at, at um, Phil Oaks and said, can you explain to us in a form that we can stomach what is going on in the country? And that made a lot of sense to me because I also had, I, I, you've all had the experience of like finding that you just cannot read the newspaper no matter how much you want to know what's going on. That's just not the way to get that information. It's just too painful. Sometimes it's just terribly written, sometimes it's written from a very dark point of view, and sometimes there's just something like, you know, the information makes you want to scream, and just hearing it written in a bland sentence is unbearable. So then I started feeling that I was under a little bit of pressure. Um, because you couldn't explain George W. Bush in a straightforward way. He was a comic proposal in and of himself. He was a pre-satirized event. <laughs> and a lot of people, uh, you know, I started noticing, I was looking around at what other songwriters were doing. John McCushion made this same joke at the time, right? You, you don't actually have to make a joke about it. You just read what he said and go, see? And it's, it's as if you had a great punchline. And, um, so it started getting a little complicated, 
And then it wasn't too long after that, as you know, that September 11 happened. At which point, <laughs> I had to rethink something. I had thought for my entire life that what an artist needs to do is to shake people up. Um, and I believe that there was a time when this was probably a good way to analyze what was going on. The audience is complacent. The public is, you know, whatever, whatever synonym for complacent you want to use. And the artist's job is to, you know, sh shock people out of their complacency in one way or another. And I'm looking at the audience that's coming to see us after September 11, and I'm looking at these people and saying, these people are not complacent. These people are freaked. They don't need me to shock them. They're already shocked. You know, <laughs> my job has to be something quite different. It's, I have to sort of like find some way of making sense now. That's actually consistent with the whole project of satire. Satire is something very close to logic, only it's broken. Satire is when you show that something makes perfect logical sense to someone just not to you, not to the person who's looking at it from the way that you've phrased it. Uh, Lewis Carroll wrote Alice in Wonderland. He was a logician. You know, like he, he wrote the most famous nonsense ever written by the human uh, species. And he was a person whose job it was to make logical proofs. That tells you something. <laughs> that the, the flip side of, of absurdity is actually sense. And what some people think is sense is the exact definition of absurdity. And you know, Donald Rumsfeld is a perfect example of that. And so, so um, it was lucky for me that Utah Phillips came to San Diego shortly after that. And it was actually, it was literally a week after September 11th. And he said it in public in front of everyone. He said, I, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I came here um, just sort of trusting that something would happen. Um, so I think I'm just going to do what I would have done anyway. And he played a Utah Phillips set. And it was beautiful. It was really an extraordinary thing to have the experience of, wait, wait, we have not actually uh, gone to hell. We have not actually lost all continuity with the past and future. The world has been as it is. It is still as it is. Something alarming has happened. A lot of people want to profit from the alarm that is happening. And it is actually our job as songwriters to slow down, to say, I have an idea, but this idea is going to take three and a half minutes to talk about. Three and a half minutes on some scales is a long amount of time. Prince Mishkin songs sometimes get real long. <laughs> There's a couple of seven minute Prince Mishkin songs, but the point is, um, rather than thinking that what you're doing is shocking, maybe what it is is actually like, let's sit for a while in one place. Let's. I used the word aerate a lot at that time. I don't want to like shake up a problem. I want to aerate it. I want to like give us a chance to breathe in it and with it. Singing is a useful thing <laughs> to go along with that metaphor. To sing collectively, I don't need to tell you about. You know what the experience of singing collectively is. But to forget that you can do that and then remember it again is very profound. And that was something that happened for me during that time. <coughs> Um, I want to stop talking for a minute. Do you have something? Do you want to sing something? Yeah. 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 Collectively. Um, it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> what time is it? How much time do we have? It's you. 'Cause Charlie's not here. Here's a song that I know you all know. Got married in a hurry and we had us a son back in 1973. I was drafted at the end of the Vietnam War, though I never did go overseas. But I remember the look on the ones who came back. Their faces still haunt me so. And I made myself a promise I would do what it takes So Jimmy didn't have to go Because if Jimmy didn't have to go There's nothing I wouldn't do That boy means the world to me And he ought to mean the world to you I don't know why we throw lives away And come home with nothing to show I only know I would sell my soul 
if Jimmy didn't have to go. Does anyone not know this song in this room? You're in for the tree. I went from the army to the army reserve. There's nothing that moves I can't fix. Didn't think much about it, just a weekend warrior. Then I turned 36, and they called me in, and they shipped me out. I'm thinking now I could have said no, but I whispered to Kathy we would finish it early, so Jimmy didn't have to go. Cause if Jimmy didn't have to go, there's nothing I wouldn't do. That boy means the world to me, and he ought to mean the world to you. I don't know why we throw lives away and come home with nothing to show. I only know I would sell my soul if Jimmy didn't have to go. They said it wouldn't come to hand to hand, though the border is just a mile away. But the enemy surprised us from behind. They were running back the other way. Guess they were looking for a place to hide. Guess they were looking for a place they'd know Wondering what the hell they were doing there And why they ever had to go But if Jimmy didn't have to go There's nothing that I would do That boy means the world to me And he ought to mean the world to you I don't know why we throw lives away And come home with nothing to show I don't know how I would sell my soul if Jimmy didn't have to go. I killed a soldier with a silent knife. I pulled him down on top of me. I looked into the eyes, staring back into mine. He couldn't have been 17. I held him as he died so quiet. I held him as he died so slow. I held him till I knew that it wasn't enough, that Jimmy didn't have to go. They sent me up for court-martial, cause I wouldn't do a thing I was told. Their lawyer said I was a coward, mine said I was just too old. But it wasn't the fear of the bombs above, or the fear of the gas below. I'm scared to meet the eyes of the Iraqi father, whose Jimmy had to go. Cause if his Jimmy didn't have to go, there's nothing I would do. That boy means the world to me now, and he ought to mean the world to you. I don't know why we go lives away and come home with nothing to show. So what we were planning to do this afternoon was that Charlie was going to do the part of the plenary called Crafting the Perfect Song. So I just thought I'd let you know that he did that. <laughs> so why is that the perfect song? There's a lot of reasons that's the perfect song. Um, one of them, for those of you who are in the Melody Workshop today, I just need to link it back to that. Jimmy didn't have to go. That's the note that he hasn't used up until that point in the song. So that's just some clever melody writing right there. But I remember the first time I heard Charlie sing this song, and it was 20 years ago. It was in fact the first Charlie King live concert I'd ever seen, although I'd heard a lot of his records, I knew his music, but I didn't know this song. And I had an experience, which I wonder if any of you also had the first time you heard the song. I heard the first verse, maybe the second verse, and I thought I got the message. I thought I knew what the song was about at that point. And what I thought was, oh, I'm at a folk concert. This sounds like a kind of a folk concert song sort of message. It's a song about a soldier from the I, that's, that's great. I'm, all, I'm on board. This is great. I can accept this. And then it turns so completely into something else. It changes so completely what the song turns out to be about. 
So in a funny way, it's the same thing that I had always loved as a kid. It's a sneak song. It goes into a place where you feel like, oh yeah, I know this, this is familiar, this belongs here with the other things we're doing tonight. And then it goes somewhere entirely surprising. I love it when art does that. <laughs> and music has an especially unique ability to do it, and songs have an especially unique ability to do it because they're based on patterns. Because they allow, they allow you to understand something, and then suddenly, with one tiny change, to understand something completely different and to show how close it is from one type of understanding to another type. And if that's not a good metaphor for a political change, I don't know what is. And if that's not a metaphor for meeting other people across boundaries, across borders, across cultural divides, and finding out what there is in common, I don't know what is. Now, we are living <laughs> in a very peculiar time. And I heard someone say earlier, and I loved it so much, I'm just gonna repeat it, uh, a thing that Reggie Harris says, and he said a couple times this year, which is that a lot of people are saying, we're living through the worst times ever in American history. At which point Reggie Harris says, you must have flunked American history. <laughs> I just took that directly from the workshop I just came from, so thank you very much. But, um, you know, yes, there's some really bad stuff going on. Yes, it's shocking, it's upsetting. And it is nonetheless part of a continuity and, you know, yesterday didn't disappear just because today is here. So, I'm working in the theater in New York City, and I'm finding something that's actually very beautiful, which is that a lot of people who I met when I moved to New York, which was at the sort of beginning of the Obama era, who I didn't think of as being political activists, are now really interested in, for the first time in their life, trying to be political activists. Many of these people are artists also, and they've probably never thought of themselves. In fact, they might have even said, I don't think of myself as a political artist up until November of last year, at which point they suddenly started looking around and saying, well, maybe we should try this political artist thing. What is, what is that thing? Um, and it's a valid question, you know, because imagine, remember back to the time when you didn't yet know. Remember how weird it was the first time you, you, you thought, maybe this is, we're really going to do this? Like, I'm going to, I've been writing a song. You, you describe an interesting story where it's like, I was, I was writing a song about myself. It's just a personal song. But then, no, it's not. So that's one way to go through it. That's one way to, to go about making that change, is to, like, sort of couch it, to sneak it in somewhere. Um, what I want to talk about... Uh, next is just a couple of interesting experiments that I've seen in the sort of theater and sometimes even musical theater, theater music community in New York by people who probably don't think of themselves as exclusively political artists, people who are still trying on the identity of activist for themselves and are therefore coming up with some pretty interesting ideas. Um, but the first one is like the question that I want to sort of put to everybody here. Let's say you've written the perfect song, or a song that's good enough. You know, let's say you've written a song that's good enough. Charlie would dispute that being, you know, you know Charlie. Um, and so one thing you can do is you can put that song on a concert of songs like it. There's nothing wrong with that. I love concerts like that. I go to them all the time. Um, David Rubix is a, a guy who I think I want to give props to you. I really like his concerts. Because when I go to his concerts, it's really interesting. It's just like one song after another. Usually about, you know, he writes them like every day. So it's, it's the only place I can go where I can see an entire concert of songs that are all about the things that happened in the last two weeks. So I think that's great. You know, it's a really amazing thing. But I go to those concerts because I already know I like that kind of concert. Now, for an audience that doesn't already know they like that kind of concert, what kind of experience might you offer to them? One thing that uh, Jermaine and I, who Jermaine performed with me, with me last night, we have a project that has reappeared a couple times in the last couple of years called Campfire Requiem. And we use that title because nobody quite knows what that means. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, like that, that's the choice of it. it. It's a requiem, so that doesn't quite fit with campfire, but people know about campfire songs and campfire stories. <laughs> So, um, what it is, literally, is a, um, a theater gets turned into a campfire, a campground, 
For some reason, we've always, we've always only done this in the winter, so we can't, we've never done it outside. So you have a fake campfire made with like Christmas lights in the middle, and this is very important. You have s'mores. It's really, no, it's really extremely important because when people come into a theater, they're not expecting something like that. So the first thing that you tell them is, welcome, here's the s'more machine. And there's actually a, a machine you can buy on Amazon for like $30. That's like a, it looks like a little toaster oven, but it's in fact for making s'mores. And, um, you know, many people, like once they get into their like 30s and so on, haven't been recently asked to make a s'more. And it takes them back, you know, it reminds them of some of their, so already they're kind of thinking of themselves in a way that they don't normally think of themselves. And they're eating the s'more, so that's, that's good, you can't go wrong there. And you start playing songs around the campfire. And these songs can be about anything. Um, you know the song, Abdul, a Bull, Bull, Amir? For a while we started with that song. Um, this is one of my grandparents' favorite songs. Um, we would start with, uh, there's a song that I wrote just sort of about the beginning of Hollywood, which I think is an interesting song. And there's a song about fast food. And um, that song about Michael Brown that we played last night is actually from that show. Um, and then there's a story. And the story begins, uh, it's about a friend of mine whose name is Moses. And it talks about a, a relationship that Moses was in, and we play a little bit of music underneath the telling of the story, and as we're playing the music under the telling of the story, the, uh, the speech, tech, I'm not going to be able to do this entire song, by the way, because I'm, I'm about to, no, no, don't, don't bother, it's just, this is just background. Thank you, though. Um, the point is that, like, at some point, as I'm talking about Moses and his friends, it starts to get a little bit wistful, and, um, there's other people sitting around the campfire and they kind of join in the background. And this goes on for 30 minutes. The story about Moses is actually a very long story. And we're not really, is it a song? Is it a story? What is it? Just the sheer experience of confusing those categories um, invites people into this experience that I don't think would come to something that's just called a folk concert. And maybe they will now. Like the goal is, that after they've been to this experience, they might ask me, where do you normally play these songs? Well, I don't know, let me tell you. Um, but, you know, that's kind of the, the goal of all of the experiments that I have seen recently, is to like, try to sort of change what you normally think of as the experience of coming to a concert. You, you all know how great it is to come someplace and sit in a, a circle instead of sitting facing the stage. But a lot of people in theater don't know that. It's really hard to do in the theater. It's expensive to move the seats around, and you can't sell as many tickets and so forth. So it's a, it's a strong choice to make. Also, have you ever been to the Highlander Center in Tennessee? Yeah. So one of the great things that they have there is a meeting room where all these chairs are arranged in a circle for them to have meetings, long meetings. And all the chairs are rocking chairs. <laughs> Isn't that great? Because, I mean, a, there's the physical reason why it's great, but it's also just remembering this feeling. No matter how long the meeting is, and no matter how tough the things you have to talk about in the meetings are, you're able to take care of yourself a little bit during that. That's also what the s'mores are for. Seriously. Um, I think it's back over to you so I can pick up my machine, which will remind me of some of the other things that I want to put on this list. Um, there's a show that I'm involved in. The title of the show is Parkland Weathers. I'm not the writer. I'm, I'm one of the performers and I'm one of the music arrangers for it. Rags Parkland is a folk singer. And he plays folk songs uh, from the year, 20, uh, the year 2600. He's, um, he's been to... Well, he had an affair with a robotic human. Um, and that's illegal. So he was sent to a prison on um, Mars, a prison camp, where they mined for various minerals that are available there. And he escaped with the help of some other robots, and they formed a band. And the band is called uh, Bow Weathers and the Future. And the band is all made up of people who are partly human, uh, well, the, the, Rags is human, but then there are people who are sort of half human, half cyborg, and I'm completely uh, cyborg. Um, all of which is illegal. So actually, 
by coming to the concert, you're breaking the law. Um, have you ever thought about what folk songs in the future might sound like? That's part of the fun of this show, is that like actually he's telling an entire story using a lot of elements of stories that we would recognize as being stories from today. You know, this, all sorts of subjects, so the labor subjects, interracial relationship subjects, are in this same story, but they're from a completely, they're, they're, they're made up, you know, they're from a fictional future. Um, I, <laughs> I, I think that there's no limit to where you could go with that. Um, writing stories about the future is always exciting because you get to decide what it is. <laughs> and you can decide how you got there. You can decide whether it's positive or negative what's happening in the future. You don't even have to be consistent. Um, another great program that I saw was called Counting Sheep, and this was done by a group of people who had been involved in the Ukrainian uh, uprising of a couple years ago. And what they did was they got rid of all the chairs in the audience, and they had us stand there, and they sort of led us through some protest songs that they learned during the, um, during the, uh, the protests, during the building of barricades. And then we had to actually do it, because they had some actors come in who were actually throwing things at us. And they, I mean, like, they were made of foam, and we quite quickly learned that we were completely safe. And you could go, you know, if, you, if it made you uncomfortable, you could go sit down. It was actually not a high-pressure situation. But it was really interesting to have the feeling of, oh, I, I actually need to learn this song now because I'm using it to communicate something. It's also interesting to discover that the uh, Ukrainian protest songs included We Will Rock You by Queen. <laughs> and it, I never thought of it before, but that's actually a pretty good protest song. And you can, you know, you can write other things in the verses, and then everyone can sing We Will Rock You, and someone's nodding. <laughs> <laughs> it was news to me, but it's great. It's really great. And it can go on forever. And that's one of the great things about songs when, they're, when you're actually on the protest line is that you need songs that can you know, keep you awake for a length of time. That are familiar. Yeah, exactly, that everyone knows. And if you don't know, you'll know it pretty soon. <laughs> so, um, these are just like ideas that I've recently gotten from the theater pieces that I've been involved in or seen, but I'm, I'm really excited by the notion that like part of the job of a folk singer could be not just to write a song, but to decide, like, where do I want to put my song? And maybe I want to put it in the middle of a potluck. You know, maybe maybe the evening doesn't have to have two hours of song. Maybe it's just three songs and a delicious meal, and a um, you know some YouTube videos. Why not? I mean, I don't know. Uh, YouTube is not my favorite thing in the world, but it is interesting that for a lot of people, the notion of like the form of a concert that's not a given anymore. And you know. We can still have concerts, so we don't have to be sad about the fact that it's not a given anymore, but it's, it's possibly of interest to us that we could say, okay, maybe we don't need a, a whole concert. There's a phenomenon, um, and I can't remember what this is called. Charlie's been talking about it a lot, but not because he's gone to it, because his nephew and niece have been going to it, who would not go to folk music concerts, and it's just that like people sign up to be told there's going to be some music at a secret location in a week, and we're not going to tell you who's going to play. You're going to get a. Um, is that what it's called? Yeah, what it's is it? very popular, and and I mean it's. Well, we think it's called shofar. Maybe that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean that's part of the that's part of the idea. But the the point is just that people sign up knowing that they don't know what they're going to get. There will be, they know there will be more than one thing in an evening, so that's important. You know, if you don't like something, something else will come along in 15 or 20 minutes. The musicians get very little pay for doing these. <laughs> that is also true, but you know, sometimes you get little pay anyway. You know? <laughs> and, you know, so all, I guess all I'm noticing is that there's something about the sort of surprise element that not only appeals to me, but seems to be appealing to a lot of people these days. You know, I want to go somewhere and not quite know what I'm going to experience. Um, you know there are escape 
rooms, right? Have you heard about these? Yes. These are actually really fun. You go someplace and you're locked in a room and there are puzzles inside the room and you have an hour to complete all the puzzles. Now the secret is, of course, that they will actually let you out of the room, but the game is to pretend that you're like uncovering, you're like, you're solving a mystery and that's how you get to the next room or something like that. Um, one of the reasons people are choosing to do things like this is because they're actually tired of the internet or they spend enough time on the internet as part of their jobs and daily lives. So the idea of getting together with friends and doing something like that is really, uh, is really appealing. And the fact of the inability to fully predict what it's going to be is what makes it like a special offer. So that's what I keep thinking is exciting about, well, since I like that about the songs that I like too, they, they don't quite end up being what they seem to be in the first place. So it fits. So that's what I'm, you know, that's kind of the question that I'm putting out. And I came up with a few answers, but I'm sure that there are more out there. It seems like uh, it's like kind of thinking a little futuristic, because I think as we have more leisure time, you know, because ultimately they're going to roboticize a lot of our jobs and stuff, I think I'll, there's got to be something else for people to do, you know, and new ways to... You know, I mean, that sounds right. kind of like that to me, that you know, what do you do with leisure, you know, with yeah. that, that's not just going to be on a screen or, you know. Right. And obviously we're not yet in the utopian right. dream world where we actually can call our leisure leisure. Right. <laughs> we have to, you know, one of the reasons to do things like an escape room is that you actually can't bring your phone into it. You know, you're, you're, in order to make sure that you have fun, that you have to put all this other stuff away. And I know that you've experienced, you know, like, recently I realized, oh, I, I want a break from work, I'll check my email. And I realized, wait a minute, then it's not a break. <laughs> well, so, you know, one of the appeals of what we do, which is live performance, is that at least marginally, the, the screen and the work world that's in our pocket is put away for a bit. Let's use that. So let's say, hey, this is this is part of the appeal of what we do. You don't have to love the songs, you know. Like you, you come here and have a strange evening, <laughs> which will include some songs and a strange game, and I think that some kind of unusual food that you haven't eaten in a while is always a good idea. Re Rice Krispies treats or something like that. You know? <laughs> something that you haven't even thought of yourself eating for decades. So I. I'm kind of done talking, except that, as you notice, I don't always stop. When I <laughs> so, if anybody has anything that they want to say, this would be a great time, or bring up. Well, I was just, uh, I mean, one of the ways I've been using music uh, is with my We Were There show. Uh, I mean, I wrote that song, We Were There, um, for the show itself, which is a, so is a show about women, uh, celebrating women as workers and um, it's scripted and um, I use slides to illustrate it. So it's uh, it's really quite a, a uh, an easy show to vent and very effective, you know, because I walk in with the script. I have all the slides lie, you know, like marked in a script so somebody can advance the slides as I'm going along and then I insert pieces of songs like Which Side Are You On, maybe a verse and a chorus, or you know, various songs throughout the, uh, the, the evening. And that's become, you know, something really uh, special. I've done it for over 25 years mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing? Can you do the song? Can you do the whole song? Well, we could. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, just as a, a note, I globalized the show because I was invited to do it in Costa Rica in uh, last October for the International Trade Union Consortium or something like that. And uh, it, it never ceases to evolve. It's always evolving. But I wrote this song in Amherst at co uh, one of the uh, that one of the co-housing things there. I was, it was a moonlit night. I had just done the show, and um, I was reading the script. And the first character 
in the show is uh, Sojourn the Truth. So the first couple lines came from her speech. We have plowed, we have planted, we have gathered into fall. Done the same work as the men with babies in our arms.